Okay, sounds good. Uh, welcome everybody to March 25th, uh, working Carpenter Working Group meeting. Um, so let's get started. Uh, first off, let's get started with the uh, project updates. Uh, from the Carpenter team, uh, main thing that we have going on is uh, our path to V1. We have, currently we have two main laundry lists. Um, one in the uh, one in the Kubernetes six, uh, as well as one in the AWS provider. Um, if you have any major issues or conversations that you would like to talk about, uh, please feel free to add it into those issues. I believe Jonathan will also be making an RFC soon, um, to include all the changes that or to compile all the you know the additions that are here, and make them into a formalized doc, and then afterwards we'll have we can have more conversations about that as well. I believe that should be going up in probably the next few weeks. Uh, yeah, but there is definitely made, uh, progress going to going to towards V1. Any questions on that? Cool. Um, next thing is our that we are also planning on working on the observability improvements. Currently, we're planning on adding health conditions to our carpenter resources, planning on hopefully uh, removing some blocking dependencies we currently have uh, against this, but making path towards this. And we soon will hopefully have an RFC to see what is uh, an integral part that customers would like to have better observability on than, than we currently deliver. Um, yeah, if you have any comments, concerns, uh, please feel free to add it into the issue. And then hopefully we should be making additions to, to that as well. Um, yeah, next thing, uh, an update from Cappy. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, things are going pretty well in the Cappy world. Like, uh, I'm, you know, I've got a scaffolding set up now. I based a lot of it on the the Quark provider, um, which, you know, is an okay starting place, but you know, I'm, I'm quickly kind of getting out of those training wheels. Um, there's two kind of questions I've been, I've been, I don't want to say struggling with, but just kind of going back and forth on, um, one of them is kind of like looking at how, uh, currently the configurations are for the AWS and Azure implementations. It, it looked to me like there's heavy use of environment variables to set them up. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of confirm what the community's approach here was. Is there like a, is there a preference for, you know, using like a lot of, like I saw the flag stuff in there, but I didn't know like what, what is the best option? You know, like I saw the helm charts using the environment variables and whatnot. Is there, is there like a community kind of opinion on this or I guess a direction I should follow or any suggestions? I have met new opinions that I've formed recently and I've never talked to anybody about. <laughs> if you want to hear them. Yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, I've been writing a couple of other controllers outside of this project and wrestling with this like library of you know defaulting from the environment variables and then backing up to the flags and i ran i ended up shooting myself in the face a couple of times with some surprising things um i decided that the complex the juice is not worth the squeeze and you should just pick one of flags or environment variables and not both um I, obviously Carpenter does both right now and I don't know what we actually, what do we do in our Helm jar right now, Nick? Do we do environment variables? Yeah, we have a, yeah, we have some environment variables that are respected for the Helm jar. Yeah, so the, well, the decision I made was you already have to do a bunch of environment variables for like, that's what the, that's what any of your libraries expect. It's like hard to pass flags to libraries due to the flag parsing ordering problem. And Environment variables are a little bit more magical, but it is like more natural to pass things like AWS region or AWS account ID to various libraries. And so I, uh, I don't know, my, in other projects, and I don't know if I'd recommend this to like Nick or any of the other maintainers here, but I decided to just throw away all that machinery and just use environment variables. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate the thoughts. And I think I think you're right. Like, in, you know, environment variables is very easy for me to throw in, especially now as I'm kind of building up the POC. So, yeah, I'll just keep going that way. And I guess like, yeah, if nobody complains, then it's probably not a not a big deal. <laughs> um, the second question I'm kind of running into, and I, I don't think this is really controversial, but I'm just trying to understand how to fit it into um, 
kind of the controllers scheme that I've seen used in the AWS and Azure one. So it, it's looking like in cluster API, you know, we're going to need to have two controllers, um, you know, one for kind of the normal node claim stuff, you know, processing those requests and doing the, you know, providing the cloud provider interface back to the core carpenter. And then the other controller will probably be the one that we'll have to have talking to our, um, you know, our cluster API uh management cluster we call it right and that and that is where this is where it's going to get complicated i think we're going to need one controller to talk to get the nodes and pods for you know that information and we're going to need another controller to talk about node claims and machines and machine sets and like the cluster api pieces because probably this is going to be deployed in a way on cluster api where we'll have a kind of a hub spoke configuration you know where it's like we'll have a management cluster and then several copies of Carpenter running in the management cluster. The resources for the spoke clusters will also be in the management cluster. And I imagine the node claims and node pools will as well. But then the nodes and the pods will need to be read from the workload clusters, you know, the complete the spoke clusters. So is there, I guess, like, am I, am I getting into a dangerous area here? Is there like a pattern I should be looking at or any suggestions, I guess, in that direction? So it sounds like the at least the events that you'd be wanting to consume for the nodes and pods would be in a different cluster, so you wouldn't be able to have like a list watch cache on those or okay. Yeah, I mean it very well could be that like the node claims and node pools exist in what we call a management cluster, and then but the nodes and pods exist in what we call like a compute cluster, right? So they would we'll have to somehow make it so that the core controller, the core carpenter controller, you know uses the right kube config to send the node claims and then uses a different kube config probably to read the the pods and nodes and whatnot. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I don't think we've actually thought about multi-tenant list watch caches because um, that's really how we uh, do it within Carpenter is that we can just rely on the list watch caches and then we also have our cluster state which keeps track of like important information that we know of. Um, the cluster state, I think in particular is also based off of this list watch cache and we just keep track of the important, uh, important events on these resources that we care about. Yeah. I wonder if there's a the way to. Do you want the node claims in your management cluster? Is that the idea? And also your CAPI APIs or would it be I... possible to have the node claims in the workload cluster? Yeah. So this is like. I was thinking about name with... conflicts and other stuff if you're doing multiple. Right. Like I was, th I was talking about this with the cluster API, uh, you know, feature group. Right. And we, and they think that like from a user, from like a user perspective, it makes more sense to have the node pools and the node claims with the machines and the machine sets and that stuff, because that's talk, that's going to be done by like an operator in the management cluster or an administrator uh, in the management cluster Whereas all the workloads are going to live in the workload cluster and they didn't, you know, they didn't think that it made sense to have the, like the node pools and node claims coming from the workload cluster while all the machines and everything lived in the management cluster. Um, and so that, that was kind of where the discussion went with the cluster API side of things. Even, even though we, you know, it's kind of interesting, the thought of having the node pools and node claims in the workload cluster, because that, that starts to break some boundaries between like the administrators and the, you know, the users of the cluster, because, you know, you can see where it's going. So, yeah, yeah. so like, I'm not, I guess this, this split between where the nodes and pods information comes from the kube config for that. And then the kube config for the node pools and node claims, like, I guess that's part of the core of Carpenter right now. So like, is that, yeah, how do, I guess, how do I split that one? <laughs> you want it to be less invasive to the Carpenter project. You could run a little proxy next to your, I've done built this for other systems, like run a little proxy next to your controller and just fork off whatever traffic you need and do whatever you want to it. So you could even like fake the kube config and then talk to the proxy and the proxy has the real kube configs and do it by mm -hmm. path, whatever you need to do. So from the perspective of Carpenter, it just looks like one cluster. Um, I don't know how you do like watch. I mean, watches are probably fine. It's it's a little bit of complexity for you to manage, but that would be like a zero code change to Carpenter approach. 
Right. And then we could deploy like a specially configured kube proxy alongside of the carpenter that we deploy. Oh, that's that might be generally useful, actually, like a like a kube multiplex proxy. That... Right. Right. I like that idea. Might even exist if you Google it. <laughs> I'm sure no one else is going to like this idea when I go back to the cluster API folks, but it's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I guess that gives me some stuff to research and whatnot. I, I appreciate the conversation here. Thanks, everybody. Okay, cool. Uh, I guess moving down, we have no RFCs, at least for this week. Uh, community question? Uh, yeah, so I'm working on trying to convince people in my company that Spot can be trusted and broad. And uh, part of that journey is going to be just getting data uh, to kind of like understand how frequently disrupted spot instances are and uh, like how much will we be theoretically like using practically across the cluster, um, that kind of stuff. So as part of this journey, I've been trying to like dig into the available interruption metrics and I'm coming up with lots and lots of zeros, even though we're running like over a hundred spot instances. Uh, I guess, uh, does anyone know anything about these interruption metrics? Uh, are they still work in progress? Are they supposed to be working? Uh, yeah. You have the interruption queue enabled, right? Sorry, say that again? You have the interruption queue enabled? Interruption queue, and is that enabled by default? Uh, we recommend it in our Helm chart. I'm not sure what your setup it's, looks like. It's not enabled by default, but you can install it yourself and you can use it. All right, that's definitely one. And I, I can tell you that it works pretty well. Okay. Um, like, yeah, it works pretty well. Like okay. you get every time you, I mean, like you, I mean, look at the metrics, like look at, I mean, you're, you're from data dogs, right? So, but if you look at the metrics of your nodes terminated and if you run it for a week, you can see every time a node is terminated from a spot that you actually see the event too beforehand. Uh, okay, so I'll see. Will I see that without this inter er, interruption queue enabled, or does the interruption queue enabled be? No, you need the queue on. You need to. You need to enable the. Like, Otherwise, you need to set up the queue. Receive messages whatsoever. Correct. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. Thank you. That's yeah. extremely helpful and succinct. Yeah. You need the. We basically need some sort of. We use an SQS queue to consume health events and instant yeah. staffing events. So if you don't have it, then or if you have like native termination handler, uh, yeah, spot termination just... handler. Assume that would be running by default for some reason, but that makes sense. Yeah. One thing to note is if you have that enabled, it's still possible, I guess, for this interruption delay messages to not occur if you have like fast expiration or fast consolidation. So, like, it actually doesn't live long enough for the spot instance to be interrupted. Um, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I assume that the an, an actual interruption has to occur and reach Carpenter before any of that would happen. And if something kills it before, then yeah, obviously you're not going to see a spot interruption. So. Yeah. Check out the fault interruption or uh, was it fault, fault injection service? Service, yeah. This is this is like the gold standard for how to test this. Like, yep. Ideally, you in your pre prod want to test that interruptions are handling or are being handled, and so you can actually just like fake them yourself and observe your resilience. So. We see customers just like being super aggressive with that in lower environments and they get, and then they get the confidence in the upper environments. Cool. Uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. One one experience that we've had is having our stage clusters in some spots 100%. Uh, again, has that interruption on there. Um, I've got weighted node pools. So the spot's number one at the moment. And then if water falls down, if spot capacity ever gets hit to an on demand, that way we know even if all the spot instances get reached, we've got a few minutes to then scale up and it goes into the on-demand pool as required. Uh, having it inside of production, one thing to be aware is, especially with AWS, there's no guarantee with spot instances. And at any point they could call in all the spot instances because another customer has suddenly requested 10,000 on-demand instances. So yeah. making sure you've got that kind of balance uh, between and having that waterfall gives that uh, security. But inside of production, we allow teams to opt in to spot through uh, affinities or soft affinities mainly just for the cost savings and utilizations, but we never mandate uh, production to be spot. And that seems to be working for us quite well. Over the past week, our spot instances have had 3,000 3, consolidations for Carpenter and 60 interruptions of spot instances. 
zone subber spot only cluster the consolidation's a lot more aggressive with our default configuration than what we get from interruptions from aws that's what i've seen as well in practice um and yeah the the main like spooky like scenario that we're super concerned about is if we're running like pods that are spread across three az's uh and then one of the az's just explodes an aws for whatever reason uh then uh everyone also running in that az outside of our company also going into pull instances from the other two remaining az's and yoinking all the spot availability we have in those other two az's which with okay. potential real outages so and, and yeah, you're we're... using the by uh, using the capacity spread right that feature like there's an example in the docs have you looked at that uh no this is a, a this is a follow-up question that is good to answer so it's, it's oh, okay. called capacity spread so we we use that for example like it's it's very useful because um it basically guarantees that for example if you say oh yeah i have three ads and whatever you can set it up to say well i only want to run two-thirds of my fleet on spot right so even if all spot goes away at the same time you yeah. have some capacity left that is on demand and that doesn't go away oh are you talking right? about just using topology spread for this yes okay. i mean as in the docs you basically use a topology spread constraint right yeah. it's called capacity yeah but yeah. basically you can guarantee like the, the way how smart carpenter is right it only spins up specific it, it it does a ratio right you can configure a ratio and mm. basically you would have a specific ratio per az if you wanted to right okay. so even if all spot goes away you still have capacity in each az and hopefully you can serve traffic for the next two minutes until new instances come up okay yeah i might ping for a, a link to the docs on that and the carpenter channel or something after this, but oh wait, put it in the Zoom chat. Thank yeah. You. Okay, this is perfect. Awesome. I will. Yeah, it's, worth, to this. Yeah, yeah, it's worth it's worth noting on this one that this is kind of like a like a hack that we that you can enforce things to be spread across your mm -hmm. node pools. Um, yeah, but it's not necessarily. There's still like a there's a cap that is uh that someone has requested, which I also need to find. Yep. of spreading your pods or spreading your nodes uh, across some common label across the whole cluster. Yep. Um, and we currently don't do that within Carpenter as like this node pool setup has suggested is that uh, we don't actually spread nodes mm -hmm. or pods across uh, AZs inherently without you telling us to. Right. So would this work uh, within the same node pool? Uh, or is that going to be like a, or are there, is there any way to say that I want to maintain that like on, only up to 50% of the node pool is uh, spot, for example, of a particular node pool, but that also does on demand and spot. I don't think you can do that today of okay. having like a per node pool, like yep. spread. So we would have to be not mixing uh, and you'd have to, yeah, okay. But you could mm -hmm. have, can you have two node pools that aren't segregated and where spot where Carpenter will choose either one? I guess you could have a preferred spot node pool and then fall back to an on-demand node pool. I think that's pretty common okay. as well. Okay, I think that answers my questions. Appreciate it. Cool. Um, next issue. Yes, migrating from Knative Blogger to a controller runtime. Hi, um, this is actually not a question, but just wanted to give a heads up that um, this logger, uh, which was based on the key native, is being replaced by the controller runtime. Um, I think there are no breaking changes or whatsoever. It's just a uh, logging uh, being changed internally in the code. But um, I think Jonathan asked me just to give a heads up to the community uh, about this change. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for that. Next thing strikes me, um, like the there's maybe a process improvement we could make here. Um, like I think we're deciding that the log formatting and content is not considered an API, and that we can change it without breaking changes. Is that? Or unless you're telling me that the logging content is literally identical to Knative, which I'd be super surprised by. Yeah, um, there were actually some questions which we kind of agreed to fix as a follow-up. 
So there are some logging that people kind of think that they are not supposed to be considered as a tracing logging, or some are considered error, but some people think that it's not an error, but just a debugging. So in the control runtime, what I did with these changes, basically I used two different levels of the logging. One is the uh, info, the other one is the debug. Um, and whatever was previously with the key native using the debug, I'm using the similar in the control runtime and whatever was in the info, but with different levels, it's also being converted into the info. But then I say, I say, I, I don't remember the name of the person because I'm new to this community, but somebody asked me to analyze the code base and see if we're using debugging messages correctly or if it's info being used correctly or if the error is being used correctly. Because sometimes some people were complaining that there's too much of logging like the debug info, the uh, debug messages being printed out, which doesn't necessarily need to be printed for every user. So yeah, I think there, there's going to be some follow-up to, to clarify um, how, how messages should be interpreted. Back to my, I guess I was trying to make a slightly different point, which was that, like, I think some of the, um, like the literal log strings that are being printed are going to be different after this change. And I think that's okay. I think that what we're essentially saying is the contents of logs are not an API and they may change at any time. So if a customer is parsing them and has logic, they shouldn't, they shouldn't expect backwards compatibility on the log. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so sure. the. I guess the call out I was trying to make is, and Nick, maybe you could take this up or you know the right place for where this should go in the docs, but we should probably in our upgrade guide or something, just be really clear about the policy. My gut, and maybe we need to just like be super explicit about this by V1. Um, but my gut is like metrics should be considered API, but log shouldn't. Uh, and of course our API is API. Uh, and then maybe like, environment variables and such as like the install parameters is maybe not considered API. Like we don't have, we don't provide a guarantee to that. But anyways, we, we should sort that out before V1 and just have a clear story. But this just came up for logging and I think it's, uh, this may be a good example to point to when we write that doc. Yeah, totally. I think, I think you're on, you're spot on with uh, how we've kind of been treating breaking changes or not right now, which is you can't rely on logging to like specific structured values or things like that to be API, but um, we do the, do that for our API. We do that for metrics. We do that for names of metrics or uh, the labels of metrics. Um, we could also talk about whether events can be relied on as, as well. Um, but I think that's definitely something we need to figure out for breaking changes going into V1. I guess moving on. Ah, I'm sorry, it's in the pubes. I guess, does anybody wants to, want to want to add on to that, to this one? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm the one yeah. who added this. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm kind of new to the project and, and Carpentry in general, but um, mainly this is, the idea of having a custom resources on nodes or transforming the resources on nodes um, where we could, you know, Carpenter only sees that a, a node has one GPU, but we can split that GPU into any number of GPUs through time slicing or MIG devices or, or whatever. Um, I'm, I realize that like DRA is on the horizon at some point, but as to, I'm not entirely sure of the actual like timelines in regards to that. Um, there's a, a second uh, open issue of, I think it's 751 um, that talks about just custom uh, resources in general, things like huge pages and, and whatnot, fused, de fused devices. Uh, 
basically I, I had an idea of, of an approach you could take to this, but I was just wondering like if there's any advice for getting started on like an RFC for this, like, is there, um, when it comes to adding like new CRDs and stuff like that, is that something the community is open to? So, um, specifically on the, whether we should have a CRD or not, I think a CRD is kind of like a big API surface that we'd want to add in and would be a lot of maintenance. Um, I think the funny thing is, I think I, like uh, the last meeting or the meeting before that, I think we'd also talked about uh, custom resources. Um, and I think Matt and I and some others discussed, maybe maybe I'm wrong about remembering this, but I think we discussed about opening another thread to discuss about custom resources and what we want to do on this, because this is a pretty long-standing issue. And yeah, we have an outdated uh, doc on how to do an RFC, but I think in terms of collaboration some people like to do like a google doc and iterate on that quickly and and then once you have a little bit more then you put it into an rfc into the issue or sorry into the into the repo um i think if if you're willing to you know have a little bit more discussions about this i think it'd be worth having some sort of open thread in like the kubernetes carpenter dev slack channel if you're not in that one already um, cause I think there's, there's been a lot of people who've asked for this before. And I think there's, there's plenty of people, plenty of capable people who are willing to work on this and start talking about it and figure out what the best solution is for this. My number one advice would be just like get consensus with the maintainers quickly, like understand the problem space, have a, have an opinion yourself and then like try to just chat on Slack or in public and just like get get consensus quickly and then and then we can produce like a more formal doc that we take take to vet against like real customer use cases or whatever but ultimately right, okay. folks like nick and jonathan and myself like there's a lot of prior art here and a lot of discussion and a lot of history i'd be happy to chat if you want to ping me on slack just like some of the history behind this i really want us to make progress on it um but it's uh it's it's thorny for sure yeah, I've, I've, I am in the Slack, so I can, I'm happy to jump in there. I think I, I did jump in there a little while ago just to, um, basically say hi, like I'm interested in solving this problem, but, uh, I have seen some of the prior art. Like I know there was a IRC, I think from Jonathan about, uh, like an instance, instance type CRD where you could like kind of alter the instance type. And I had a, a somewhat similar idea where it's effectively like a node pool transformer where you could target a node pool and specific instances in that node pool and then transform those at the evaluation stage um, to add those custom. Anyway, you don't have to get into the whole thing, but yeah. And you have the use case yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we've, the company I work for is recently started a migration to Kubernetes and we have a large amount of GPU work nodes, mm -hmm. um, workloads. Um, and like our solution right now is effectively just have like a pod that kind of does nothing that anti affinities to its existing pods so that it, it a, a node just kind of sits there pre-ready with the resources available to, to schedule st stuff with custom resources. Um, so that carbon doesn't have to be in the loop. <laughs> yeah, we that's that sucks. Let's do better. <laughs> so I'm, yeah, I'm super excited. <laughs> we, we, this this is working. Back I also, oh, go ahead. I also you know called in just because of this issue, and here in Intel we're also keen to contribute if this is. Uh, acceptable um, and the use case is pretty similar so we've also experimented with this sort of uh, extra ports and whatnot uh, those usually they don't work always as you one would expect there are always some kind of a drawbacks with those kind of approaches so would really want to have a proper solution here the fatal flaw last time is that we had a theoretical use case and not a real use case. And so like, I'm glad both of you have the real use case. It's like, it, it's just always going to be easier. I mean, I think in general for the project, we push back pretty hard unless we have like 
someone who's actually going to use it immediately. And this is the only thing that they can do just because otherwise you end up building a bunch of theoretical things and the project kind of gets crushed under its own weight. So um, I think we have, I'm excited that we might have a better chance of success this time around, given that you guys have the concrete use case and are, are excited to drive it with us. Um, I mean, for people who do have uh, actual use cases and are blocked by issues similar to this, where's the best place for us to surface that kind of like user story? So then we can work and ensure that the solution that's being designed is compatible with all of our different uh, individual use cases for this. Well, you say, um, sorry, you said you have a concrete use case or you have a theoretical use case? Oh, no, this, uh, we've, uh, Apple, so we've got a, uh, exactly the same, not with the GPU time splitting, but with KPMs. And so we've got requirements on the KPM requests and limits, which Carpenter can't handle. Um, my workaround right now is using an open provisioner. So it commissions those relative nodes and therefore those pods get scheduled. And then when the overvisioner runs out of capacity, Carpenter then kicks in and creates more relevant nodes. It's not pretty because it's uh, overvisioning the cluster, but it does the job for us to continue to roll out Carpenter to all of our clusters. But it is something where this mega issue and from what sounds like related to the topic I was just discussed that would be the solution. And the, the one thing I'm seeing is that there are multiple ways and you can see in this particular PR, we've got multiple potential uh, PRs which could resolve this issue. And it's just making sure that we've got, a, as you mentioned, the maintainers uh, are happy with the direction that this is going because it sounds like it's becoming more of a common issue and likely one that would need to be a one point inside 1.0 for it to really become uh, mainstream based on what I'm hearing in, on the call. Yeah, I'd recommend just collating. We typically use mega issues for this. So this one we have highlighted here just um, we should probably link like the RFC that we did to this and just kind of, I guess it is technically linked. Um, yeah, but we, we tend to like track these like major uh, initiatives in the project um, in, in mega issues and then link all the stuff to that. Okay, um, might start some threads as well and we'll a thread in the, the carpenter dev because see if there's anything we can do as the the work around until such time uh, these issues uh, get developed, tested, and released. Yeah, I also just put a message in the Carpenter Dev thread. I'm going to make a Google Doc so we can start aggregating all these use cases and actually start talking about it in a Google Doc so that uh, someone doesn't come say hi and then we forget about their message uh, two months later. That's great. Thanks very much, uh, everyone, for hearing me out. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, is there anybody else that has any other questions? Any other comments that you would like to to share? If not, then we can call it good for today. Okay, sounds good. Um, yes, I guess that will conclude our meeting for today. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Good job.